on to the praise of the Lord. Returning once again to Psalm 23, we want to bring our gospel evening message uh, from this passage, and I trust that the Lord will speak to our hearts and that all will be able to say that the Lord is my shepherd tonight. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee that tonight we're in the house of the Lord. And we thank thee, Lord, for every believer tonight that can say they're going to the Father's house, there to dwell forevermore. Thank you, Lord, for the confidence we have tonight in the work that Christ has done and the salvation he has wrought through the bloodshed in Calvary. We rejoice tonight that we have joy unspeakable and full of glory because we are thine. We pray tonight in this gospel message you will speak to souls that are out of Christ without a saviour. Pray, O oh Lord, that you'll show them their need of Christ. Show them that all their need can be met in him. And we pray that this night souls will call upon the Lord Jesus Christ to save them, to be their saviour, their shepherd and their friend. 
And we know that thou hast said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. O oh Lord, thou art a call away from the sinner tonight. And I pray you'll give him grace to call. Lord, empty me of self and sin. Fill me with thy spirit, I pray. And give me help to preach the word of God to the glory of thy name. For as in Christ's name we ask these things for his eternal glory. Amen and amen. This morning we were thinking about the character of the shepherd and how the shepherd is described in scripture. And we had five thoughts. We thought about the good shepherd. We thought about the great shepherd. We thought about the chief shepherd. Then we thought about the smitten shepherd and we went to Calvary and stood as the sword of justice and the wrath of God was plunged into Christ. And how he willingly bore our sins in his own body on the tree and suffered the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. And then we were reminded that he was the appointed shepherd. One shepherd is set up. One shepherd to save. One shepherd to lead. One shepherd to worship. And he is our shepherd. And there's just a couple of points that I didn't get time to speak on this morning. I want to leave before you. And it's wonderful the way it's worked because they are gospel points and we certainly want to present to you a saving shepherd. If you turn with me to Luke chapter 15, we find the seeking shepherd. Luke chapter 15, the seeking shepherd. Verse 3, And Christ spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbours, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Whenever we consider the Lord Jesus Christ as the shepherd, we see some remarkable things in this parable that are true of the seeking Savior. The first thing that we find is that the shepherd has a concern for the lost. He is counting his sheep. He realizes that one of them is missing. And though he has 90 and 9, he does not say that's enough because there's one that needs his help. There's one that needs his salvation. There's one that needs his deliverance. And therefore, he is concerned for the lost. Do you know, dear sinner, the Lord has a greater concern for your soul than you do for your own soul. He is concerned about your soul. Before we were saved, we had no desire to be saved. We had no concern about our soul. We had no thought about eternity. We had no thought about how we stood before God. But even away back in eternity past, before this world was fashioned, before the world was brought into being, God had a concern for your soul and for mine. And that plan of redemption was made in glory. And praise God, that plan of redemption was wrought upon this earth almost 2,000 years ago. And not only do we see a shepherd who is concerned for the sheep, but we see a shepherd who goes after the sheep. And that's why the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world. He said he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And he sought uh, many in this gathering. He has saved them by his grace. And we can say the reason we're saved tonight is because the Lord sought me. And he found me. And he brought me unto himself. It's not that we were seeking the Lord but it is rather that he was seeking after us. Here's a shepherd that goes after the sheep. Isn't it wonderful that the Lord is interested in sinners tonight? The Lord is seeking sinners tonight. You in this gathering, the Lord is calling you tonight for salvation. Every time the Bible is open, every time the gospel is preached, Christ is calling. His arm is outstretched, beckoning you to come to him for salvation. Not only do we see a shepherd who is concerned about the sheep and goes after the sheep, but you will find that he lifts the sheep. He lifts the sheep because when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. What has he done? He's lifted it. Maybe it's got caught in a thicket. Maybe it's got injured and can't walk anymore. Maybe it's on the edge of a cliff and it's petrified and it can't move. Whatever 
The need is the shepherd reaches down and he lifts the sheep up from the place of wandering and puts it upon his shoulders. That's what the Lord Jesus Christ can do for the sinner tonight. He can lift the sinner out of the depths of their sin, out of the filth of their sin, out of the mire of their sin, out of the pit of their sin. Only Jesus can lift sinners into a place of grace, into a place of righteousness, into a place of blessing. Only Christ can do it. And praise God, he can do it. The shepherd also brings the sheep home. It says in verse number six, when he cometh home. He has come home and the sheep has been upon his shoulders. He's carried that sheep. And I think of that lovely hymn that we sing, he will carry you through. And that's what the Lord does for his people. And sometimes we see some of God's people and they've gone through trials and they've gone through difficulties and they've gone through hard times. And people come to them and say, how have you made it through? And you know what the answer of the child of God is? He, he has carried me through. Christ has carried me through. Grace hath brought me safe thus far. And grace will lead me home. And we have the wonderful confidence that not only will the Lord bring us to this point in time, but he will bring us home. The work that he has begun, praise God, he will complete. And then we find something else because it says at the end of verse number six, rejoice with me for I have found my sheep which was lost. The shepherd rejoices over the sheep. The shepherd rejoices over the sheep. Why? Because that sheep is safe. That sheep is saved. We read of the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe it's in Matthew chapter 9. And as he was looking over uh, the people, Matthew 9, verse number 36, it says, When he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And the Lord was moved in his heart. He was sorrowful because he looked at the people. Here he was in the midst of them. Emmanuel, God revealed to us. And yet here was a people going about. They had no shepherd. They had no savior because they had rejected him. A friend, tonight as we are in this gathering and the Lord looks upon us as you're at home watching online, the Lord looks upon you. And one of these two images is true. Either the Lord looks upon you with that compassion and with tears and with weeping and sorrow because you are without a shepherd. It's not that there isn't a shepherd, but you have not responded to the shepherd. You're not following the shepherd. You've not called out to this saviour. But praise God tonight for those who are saved. There is great rejoicing as the Lord looks upon us. Why? Because we have been rescued. We have been redeemed. We have been saved by him. Praise God tonight you can be saved as well. He can lift you. He can make you clean. He can bring you to the place of safety. And praise God he rejoices over the sinner that is saved. What holds you back tonight from calling upon him? What is it that hinders you from saying, Lord, save me, lift me from my sin and my guilt and my shame? Whatever it is ought to be repented of this moment because nothing, absolutely nothing, nothing in this world is worth missing Christ. Nothing in this world is worth missing Christ. He is the seeking shepherd. Will you listen to his call tonight? Will you come to him? Then go to Isaiah chapter 40 and we find another image of our great shepherd in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number 11. It tells us here, he shall feed his flock like a shepherd and he shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. It's significant that the lamb is mentioned here. And we shouldn't overlook that. Yes, the Lord will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will provide for them. But it says especially he will gather the lambs with his arm. What's a lamb? A lamb is the newborn of the flock. And as such, 
for a little while. It needs some extra care. It needs that extra attention. And the Savior himself has a personal interest in the newborn believer. Each little babe in Christ is precious to him. He gathers the weak. He gathers them that take their first little steps of faith in Christ. And we're all weak without his power. He gathers those with his arm, that strong arm, that everlasting arm, that eternal arm of God is caring for and protecting you, dear believer. Oh, many times we're weak, but the arm of God bears us up in kindness. Times we're weary, at times we struggle, and the Lord by his arm supports and sustains us and protects us. Not only that, it says he carries them in his bosom. And that thought is the head laying upon the breast as a child would lay its head upon a mother or father's breast. And to be carried in his bosom means to have a close and a blessed fellowship with him. He expresses his love to his people as he cares for them. This is a place of safety. This is a place of peace. The hymn writer said, Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. Hide me, O oh my Saviour, hide, till the storms of life are past. Safe into the heaven, guide, O oh, receive my soul at last. All their refuge, I have none. Hangs my helpless soul on thee, leave, ah, leave me not alone, still support and comfort me. Plenteous grace with thee is found, grace to cover all my sin. Let the healing streams abound, make and keep me pure within. Oh, to be resting upon Christ, that place of safety, security, peace and protection. And what else does the Lord do in this verse? He gently will lead those that are with young. He gently leads his people. Ah, there are times that we see people leading a group, whether it's in their country, whether it's in their church, whether it's maybe just a group in an organization or a club, and they lead harshly. They lead harshly, and they try to beat people in submission. Friend, look what it says about our shepherd. He will gently lead those that are with young. And friends, step by step, day by day, line upon line, precept upon precept, the Lord is leading and blessing his children. This is the way God deals with us. He leads us. And it's interesting that in Psalm 23 that we're studying at this time, at least twice in that psalm, it says, he leadeth me. And that is one of the things that the Lord does for his people. He leads us. And therefore, if we come back to Psalm 23, we have considered the shepherd. The shepherd who is seeking. The shepherd at times weeping over the lost. The shepherd who gently leads his people with kindness and graciousness. And look what it says at the end of that verse. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And if you can say the first part of the verse, then you can say the next part of the verse. I shall not want. The word want means to lack something or to have need of something. In Nehemiah chapter 9, 21, it says, 40 years did thou sustain them in the wilderness so that they lacked nothing. And there's a testimony that in the wilderness, for those 40 years that the children of Israel uh, were wandering, that the Lord provided everything that they needed. In fact, their clothes Wax not old, their feet swelled not. They didn't have to get changes of clothes for 40 years because the Lord miraculously preserved their clothes and their shoes and their, even their health to go into the wilderness in a mighty, mighty way. And as the Lord provided for the children of Israel in the wilderness, so the Lord provides for you and me and every want that we have will be supplied. Now, of course, this is speaking about spiritual needs, the spiritual needs of the soul. Now, we have physical needs that we can meet. We need to be fed and watered. We can do that ourselves. We need to keep ourselves uh, fit and active. We can do that ourselves. There are different needs that we can meet. But only Christ can meet our spiritual needs. 
And therefore, if this is the case, if only those who say the Lord is my shepherd can say that they will want for nothing, friend, those who tonight are not saved have great needs in your life. There are things that you're lacking tonight that you need, and only this shepherd can provide. Now, we will be going down this verse by verse in the coming weeks in the will of God. And as we look down, we see that some of the needs are met. He leads us. He restores us. He is with us. He prepares for us. He anoints us. uh, He provides for us. And there's all of these different things that we'll be looking at in detail tonight. But for those who are not saved tonight, there are things that only Christ, the great shepherd, the good shepherd, can give to you. And I want to think about them tonight. So if you're not saved, what are your spiritual needs? What are the needs that you have in this meeting tonight? And as we close, I want to leave the needs that you have tonight before you. And then I want to remind you that Christ, the shepherd, can meet you at the point of your need. The first need that you have is a need for cleansing from sin. If you're not saved tonight, you need to be cleansed from sin. You know, maybe you're sitting here tonight, my greatest need is to get this done tomorrow and that done tomorrow, that bill paid, that assignment handed in, that job done. No, your greatest need tonight, if you're not a Christian, is a need to be cleansed from your sin. This is the most pressing need that you have. Why? Because sin defiles a person. Sin defiles a person. We have been reminded in Romans chapter 3 earlier this morning that there is none righteous. No, not one. There's not one can say they're without sin. There's not one can say that they're not defiled. And we all need the cleansing that only God can give. And you know in scripture, there are various times whenever the Lord gives a picture of the cleansing that we need. Let me show you an example. Turn to the book of Ezekiel. And in Ezekiel chapter 16, there is, uh, Ezekiel chapter 16, just before the book of Daniel, there is a description of the work of the Lord. Let us see that in verse number 6. Well, let's read from verse 4 for context. And as for thy nativity or thy birth, in the day thou wast born, thy navel was not cut, neither wast thou washed in water to supple thee. Thou wast not salted at all, nor swaddled at all. None I pitied thee to do this, any of this or these unto thee, to have compassion upon thee. But thou wast cast out in the open field to the loathing of thy person in the day that thou was born. And when I passed by thee and saw thee polluted in thine own blood, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Yea, I said unto thee, when thou wast in thy blood, live. Verse 8. Now when I passed by thee and looked upon thee, behold, thy time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt or my garment over thee and covered thy nakedness. Yea, I swear unto thee, I entered into a covenant with thee, saith the Lord, and thou becamest mine. Then washed I thee with water. Yea, I washed all away, uh, sorry, I I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. And there we see the picture. A little babe born into this world, unclean, uncared for, filthy, polluted, putrid, because of the very blood solidified upon the body. And the Lord comes in mercy and compassion. And he comes and enters into a covenant to cleanse and to care for this little one. And that's a picture of what Christ does for sinners. If only we could see the vileness and the wickedness of our sin. If only we could see how abhorrent it is before a holy God and how filthy and dirty and defiled and polluted we truly are. We would call on the Lord to do for us what he did for this little baby. That the Lord would come and the Lord would wash us. And the Lord would save us. And the Lord would enter into a covenant with us and make us his. Because I'll tell you, the Lord is ready and willing to save And we read that the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Do you know there was a man in scripture who had leprosy? And he desired to be clean. And he saw Jesus and he fell on his face. And he besought him saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. 
Lord, you can do it. I know you can cleanse me from my leprosy, from my defilement. And the Lord put forth his hand and touched him and said, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy departed from him. This man had a great need to be cleansed from the defilement of leprosy. And he found Jesus and he called upon him to meet him at the point of his need. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Have you called on him to save you? Friend, this is so important because in Revelation 21, 27, it says, there shall in no wise enter into heaven anything which defileth. Anything that is defiled or with sin, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And dear sinner, tonight in this meeting, you need to be cleansed from your sin. And praise God, there is a Savior who can do that through the bloody shed on Calvary. That's your greatest need tonight. Another need that you have, another want in your life, something that's missing, is forgiveness. Forgiveness. You need to be forgiven tonight. You have broken and transgressed the law of God. You, dear sinner, tonight have wasted the life God has given you and the opportunities God has given you by spending them in sin. You've neglected the needs of your soul. You've lived in foolishness and pride and in rebellion. And, rebellion, and you said, I don't need God. And friend, you have offended a holy God. All sin is against God. All sin is offensive to God. And therefore, tonight, you need to be forgiven for the sins that you have committed. Not only do you need to be forgiven, you need to be reconciled to God. Because the sinner is estranged from God. The sinner is born as an enemy of God, and we are separated from God because of our sin. There is a great gulf between God and the sinner, and that gulf is the gulf of our sin. And friend, we cannot pass over it, and we certainly cannot bridge it. But we read these words in Romans chapter 5, verse 10. When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. And that's the way you are brought into a relationship with God. Some people think, I want to get right with God, so I'll go to church. You're no more saved by going to church than you are sitting in a public house somewhere. You're no more saved being baptized than not. You are no more see of giving money to the Lord's work or joining a particular church. The word of God says we are reconciled to God by the death of his son. And that's when a man or a woman, a boy or a girl says, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. And I'm trusting that the work you did on the cross of Calvary is enough to save me. It's sufficient. And Lord, I pray you'll wash me in the blood and forgive me and reconcile me tonight. Bring me to God. Bring me into a relationship with God. And praise God. The blood cleanses. Christ forgives us. And we are reconciled to God. And we become the children of God. Once strangers, now children. Once enemies, now we refer to God as our heavenly Father. Why? Because the blood of Jesus Christ has removed the sin. Dealt with the sin. And brought us nigh to God. This is only possible through faith in Christ. It is possible now. Friend, where you're sitting at in this meeting, you can call on the Lord now to save you, to forgive you, to reconcile you. The hymn writer said, I once was a stranger to grace unto God, but praise God, tonight every believer can say, now I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. I'm on my way to heaven. I have a heavenly father he has provided a wonderful salvation for me. Another great need you have tonight, a great want in your life, is a need of rescue. Rescue. Because, dear friend, without Christ, you're in great danger tonight. Danger from the punishment of sin. From the wrath of God. Remember, we spoke this morning about God's anger and wrath poured out upon Christ. A Calvary as he died in the place of sinners. Do you realize, do you realize, dear sinner, that if you're not trusting in the work of Christ on Calvary, then you will know that wrath of God falling upon you someday. You will know that wrath and anger of God that Christ suffered on Calvary. 
and it will fall upon you. Now, because he was a perfect sacrifice, he was able to bear the wrath of God and satisfy the justice of God. But friend, if you die in your sin and the wrath of God comes upon your sinful soul, you will never come to an end of suffering or of the wrath of God or the reality of hell because your sin deserves everlasting judgment. The darkness, the terror, the endless torment and fear. Friend, this is the end of sin. This is the end of a life without Christ. And you need to be rescued from hell. You need to be rescued from that eternity in hell. Now once you're there, it's too late. You can cry for a thousand years and repent and say you believe in the blood. My friend, it's too late. You must turn to the Lord in time. You must be rescued in time. In your lifetime. Now the dying thief was rescued just moments from eternity. And we praise God for that. But don't you presume you'll have a deathbed opportunity? Because friend, you could drop like that. No opportunity. Dear unsaved person, how close are you to hell tonight? You can't answer that question. But you do know you're closer than you've ever been before. Dear unsaved person, tell me how many more opportunities will you have to turn from your sin and trust in the Savior? You can't answer that. But you know before God tonight that you wasted most of this opportunity because the meeting's almost over and you're not saved. Should this be your last hour upon this earth? Where will you be the moment you close your eyes in death? Friend, you need cleansing, you need forgiveness. You need reconciliation, you need rescued, and you need eternal life. We read away at the start of our message this morning, in John chapter 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But the verse before it tells us, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Dear sinner, there's deadness within. You're dead spiritually in trespasses and sin. And if you are spiritually dead in time, you'll be spiritually dead in eternity unless you could see it. And this shepherd, only this shepherd, only this Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave his life, can give you true life, spiritual life, abundant life. What does that word abundantly mean? Well, I was reading a commentator, and he said that the word, the Greek word for abundance has a mathematical meaning, and it generally denotes a surplus, more than enough. And therefore, the abundant life is above all the contented life. And that contentment is based upon the fact that God is able to meet every need, every emergency, everything that comes across our path according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Therefore, the abundant life is, I can go out into this wicked world tonight. I can go out into this wicked world tomorrow in the will of the Lord with contentment and peace in my heart because I have abundant life. No matter what I face, Christ will supply my need. No matter what that need is, the Lord has prepared for it and the Lord has grace sufficient for it. And therefore, I don't need to fear. I don't need to panic. I don't need to worry. I don't need to live as if there's no hope. But I have abundant life, life that's provided for every step from earth to glory. Praise God. I can put my head in the pillow tonight and say, thank you, Lord, that you have given me abundant life. And every need is met. 
As we close, look at this verse one final time. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. C.H. Spurgeon said the sweetest word of this verse is that word, my. The psalmist does not say the Lord is the shepherd of the world at large and leadeth forth the multitude as a flock. No. But he says the Lord is my shepherd. And if he be a shepherd to no one else, he's a shepherd to me. He cares for me. He watches over me. He preserves me. Listen to these two verses, Psalm 34 and 9. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. And dear friend, tonight, as we have come to effectively two sermons on one short verse in Scripture, because there's so much in this verse, I ask the question for the final time. Is he your shepherd? Is he your shepherd? Are you following in his footsteps? Are you going to his eternal home? Are you washed in his blood? Are you resting in his power? Can you say, he is my shepherd? Friend, if you can tonight, you ought to be thanking the Lord with a heart overflowing because you're his tonight. Pray for those that are not yet saved. Dear believer, pray tonight that the Lord will move and speak to hearts even as we sing these closing words. We're singing, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood. Lose all. Their guilty stain. Dear sinner tonight, don't leave with your sin and your stain and your guilt. Dear sinner at home tonight, don't turn off and go and do something else or turn over to something else. But get this matter settled tonight. Get your soul under the blood of the Lamb. Repent from your sin and call on God for mercy. And praise God, you will be saved. We are going to sing just the two verses, the first two verses of this hymn. Dear believer, rejoice and sing it out. And dear unsaved person, think of these words. You can be saved tonight. May God speak as we sing these two verses. and close your eyes is that your testimony have all your sins been washed away he has promised to remove your sin as far as east is from the west every single one oh dear sinner what are you waiting on tonight come while the saviour and mercy is pleading come to the fountain for cleansing Come to the shepherd 
who loves you tonight and who will save you. Maybe there's one who would like to speak to me. I'll be available after the service. Let me know. Maybe you've trusted Christ. Let us know. But come now. Father in heaven, we know that thou art here by thy spirit tonight. We know, Lord, there's a stillness in this house tonight. The word of God is going forth into hearts. The spirit of God is doing a work. We thank you that God's people are blessed because they realize how much they owe to Christ tonight. And how many of these great blessings are ours tonight in him. But Lord, there are those tonight and they do not know Christ as their saviour. Oh Lord, if we could, we would carry them, but we can't do it. Lord, only thou can save. And I pray you'll put a desire in hearts tonight to be saved. Lord, cause them to consider their eternity. Cause them to realize they're not guaranteed the next hour, never mind the next day. And that now this is the accepted time and this is the time of salvation. Lord, give victory tonight. Whatever's holding the sinner back, whether it's the world, the flesh, or the devil, Lord, defeat them in Jesus' name and bring sinners unto thyself. Glorify thy Son, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name and for his glory alone. Amen.